Can I just get an idea of how many people know what Genius Hour is already? Okay. Is there anybody who's tried it? In the their self directed class? learning. Right? Yeah. Because, okay. Okay. yeah, so passion projects. So, for anybody who doesn't already know, um, Genius Hour is a movement. It allows students to explore their own passions and their own ideas within a time allotted within the classroom. So, it promotes creativity and also student choice. So, I found a really good video that will describe what Genius Hour is, just for anybody who doesn't know, or just maybe to give you some other ideas about what it is, that I found online by Chris Kessler, who's a teacher in the US, who has a lot of resources online about Genius Hour. So it's just a quick video that will give us a little uh, idea. There's a movement happening right now in classrooms all over the country that encourages students to explore their own passions and creativity. Students of all grade levels will be engaged like never before. I present to you Genius Hour. This is where student passions come to life. Genius Hour has many roots, but is based on a business practice that Google uses with their development team. They allow their developers to spend 20% of their time at work on projects that interest them, provided that it has the potential to advance the company. The idea is simple. Allow employees to focus on their own passion projects and productivity will go up. There are many commercial projects that have been developed by these 20% projects, including Gmail, Google Talk, and Google News. Fortunately for students, Educators have grasped onto the idea and coined the term Genius Hour. This is where teachers allow students to work on whatever project they want during their own learning time. We've all had students in our class that aren't motivated by the traditional school environment. The beauty of Genius Hour is that it provides a path to intrinsic motivation. When students have a say in their learning, they become much more engaged, their confidence is boosted, and the entire learning process becomes, you guessed it, fun. I have three rules for Genius Hour projects. The first rule is there must be a driving question. The student needs to be able to communicate what they want to learn about. If we can go out and find the answer on Google with a quick search, then the question is going to need some tweaking. Secondly, the project must involve research. If a student wants to build a model rocket that goes 200 feet in the air, then they need to provide the resource they use for that project. The last part is that the project must be shared. Ideally, the project needs to be shared not only with a class, but shared with the entire world. Okay, so that's just a quick overview of what Genius Hour is and um, some of the rules that he has in his class when they do Genius Hour. So a few years ago, I heard about Genius Hour and I was really interested because I liked the idea of my classroom being more like a workshop where kids came in and they got going on things that they were interested in and there was less me and more of them. So I dove right into it, like I do with a lot of things. And there were some things that worked out really well the first time I tried it, and then there were some things that I knew I needed to improve. So the first thing that worked really well is that the students were highly engaged. They'd chosen something that they wanted to do, they were totally into it. And they were excited about coming to class. They would run down the hall after break or after whatever class, because they knew, uh, other class they were at, because they knew it was time for a genius hour. Um, the other thing I knew that I did really well was that I gave them a voice and a choice in their learning. And so that also helped with the engagement. Some of the things that I didn't feel very comfortable with or confident with, I don't know that I held the students accountable during that time. Um, there was a lot, of, a lot of open time and there was a lot of freedom. And I wasn't sure if I was holding them accountable for certain um, expectations in the curriculum which leads me to this I don't really know if I had connected it to the curriculum I had given my students a lot of time to work on their projects and I thought it was really unfortunate there was great learning happening and I wasn't sure that I had really recognized it and evaluated it or reported on it in a formal kind of way and I thought that was a kind of unfair to them too so I decided to try it again last year with my grade 7 French immersion class so I'm talking to you from the perspective of a language teacher, um, but hopefully you can take from this something that you can then apply to whatever subject that you're um, doing. So when I started again last year, I knew I needed to give them a lot of thinking time. Because if I asked you right now, what's your passion, you're going to start a project tomorrow, 
some of you might know right away what your passion is and you could get started. And others, like myself, I would have no idea where to start. I wouldn't know what passion to focus on. I wouldn't even know if I had a passion. So I needed, I knew I needed to give them a lot of time to think and reflect about what they wanted to do. Passion projects, the idea of it, it sounds really exciting to us as teachers, but it can be really scary for some kids. I found that kids who maybe struggle in a more traditional classroom setting, they were super excited about it. And then students who were really successful in that traditional setting, they were really scared because they weren't sure what it was going to look like and they wanted somebody to tell them what to do. So um, I had to respect that and so I gave them lots of time. So I think there was a three week build up where I talked about it and I did a lot, gave them a lot of inspiration and I planted a lot of seeds throughout those three weeks so that they could go home and think about what they're interested in doing. So these are some of the things that um, I showed them. I showed them a video called Kane's Arcade, which you may have seen, about a boy who creates an arcade out of cardboard boxes. So it shows that something small could become something really extraordinary. Um, I showed them Audrey's Rube Goldberg machine. The Rube Goldberg machine is a complicated way to do a simple task. And in that video, he shows the importance of failure leading to success. So lots of failure led to one great success. Um, Nat and Lowe's 20% project, these are two women who work at Google, and they were interested <coughs> in discovering the 20% projects that their colleagues were doing at Google. So they made videos that uh, showed these different projects that were happening. So I showed some of those to my students just to get the wheels turning about different things they could explore. This last one, I'm going to show you a little bit of it. It's Kevin Brookhauser's 20% projects. He's a teacher in the US. Uh, I saw him speak at Google Summit locally. And he does a lot of work around 20% projects. And so he put together a little video of his high school students and um, really briefly summarizing what their projects were. So I showed this to my students and I could see all of a sudden their minds expanding and exploding a little bit. So I'll show you some of the things that his students did for their projects. <laughs> I experienced one month in a wheelchair to see life from a different point of view. I'm writing a book of short stories to help teenagers identify with themselves. With the help of therapy dogs, we shared our love for animals and brought happiness to hospital patients and children. I choreographed, learned, and filmed the Spanish ballroom routine. I cut sugar out of my diet to bring awareness of the epidemic of diabetes in America. I read, directed, and produced a dramatic horror on teenage revenge. I created a piece of experimental short fiction. I built a community of readers with over a thousand subscribers by making videos about books on YouTube. We decided to explore the upsides and downsides of being naturally quiet by taking vows of silence and making an effort to speak up more. I devoted my mornings to composing an excessively complicated jazz piece. I designed a reusable bag to do my part and encourage others to do their part in saving the ocean. I put together a group of York musicians and we mentored students from a middle school band in Maria. I've been producing original music using Logic Pro. I published a children's book for third graders. So um, these kind of got them thinking about, think differently about learning. So the idea that they could do an experiment or that they could create something or that they could just learn something about a, an interest that they had. So after showing them all of these um, different little pieces of inspiration throughout a few weeks, I asked them to come to class ready with an idea that they would like to further explore. So um, on that day, I asked them to complete a project proposal. This project proposal, I hadn't done it previously. And this time, I think it was one of the things that made the project such a success. Because this one's in French. I have an English one if you want a copy. Um, it really got them to focus on where they wanted to be by the end. So I asked them things like, um, I should also say I stole this from another teacher, borrowed it from another teacher, Sherry Stokes. She shared um, a lot of resources <coughs> on Google Drive. There's tons of stuff out there. You don't have to create all on your own. Um, so I asked, we asked, what's your big idea? Why did you choose this subject? Um, how is this going to help other people or how is it going to help you? What will it look like at the end? So we got them thinking with the end in mind so they had a big picture of what it is they wanted to do. We also asked them to think about the process. So um, what are the steps that you're going to take? This one was tough for them because they thought, well, one step was enough. 
and then the more that we kind of pushed them, they realized there were quite a few steps and helped keep them focused throughout the project. We also asked them things like, what challenges do you think you might encounter? And then what can you do when those things happen? And so the really nice thing about this, which I signed as to, to approve it, was that it showed them the importance of planning. Because it's really exciting to jump into a project. I often get caught up in that kind of thing too. But they saw that it was really important to plan. And it was a way to get unstuck. So throughout the process, if they were stuck on an idea or they had a challenge, Sometimes they could go back here and they had already solved it at the beginning and they had forgotten. It also held them accountable. There was that accountability piece. They could constantly go back to their proposal to make sure they were on track and to keep them focused. Sometimes the proposal changed. So it was like a living document that evolved. So if they came back to it and they thought something wasn't working out, they just changed the proposal. Sometimes they scrapped the proposal completely and started over when something wasn't working out. So these were some of the project ideas that came from those proposals. Um, two girls decided to knit for refugees to support the students that were coming to our school. Um, one group decided to challenge our whole school to go tech-free for the day. So they made a whole campaign and all the kids had to put their devices at a 7-8 school. That was quite an accomplishment. Um, a, a boy who's rather a reluctant learner he learned how to code on Scratch, and he made um, a series of video games, like an arcade, and then he had the whole class playing those. This girl wanted to teach students in West Africa how to read in English, so she created a series of videos to do that. And then um, we had a girl make a hammock, and um, another girl decided to make a book sculpture. And there were lots of different kinds of Tasks. They were all very diverse. As you can see, some of them require a lot of technology, others required very little. So I realized I didn't need to be the technology expert. I didn't need to be the expert really in any of those particular projects. I don't need to know how to make hammock. What I needed to be able to do instead was to help students problem solve and also to be able to connect their learning to the curriculum, which is what I had trouble doing the first time I tried this. <coughs> when we didn't have the answers, we asked experts on Twitter <coughs> because I knew I didn't need to know all the answers and I think sometimes that's what holds us back from doing these kinds of projects. Um, we used YouTube, trial and error, we asked parents, parents were an awesome resource because there were engineers um, in our parent community and they could come in or they could tweet us or send messages about how to solve problems that we had. We asked our DLSTs. We had Elke Baumgartner come in to support my class whenever she was available. And sometimes we just made up a solution. With the paper, the book sculpture, there was really no how to, so she just made up her own way to do it. And that really showed them how to solve problems in real life. <clears throat> I didn't assess the final project, product of the project. Like I couldn't assess a hammock. And I couldn't assess their knitting. So instead, um, because I wanted them to take risks. I wanted them to try things that might fail, and that's okay, because it wasn't assessing that final piece. So instead, I assessed the process, which I'll talk about, and a final presentation. So last year, we all, at the end, kind of did a TED Talk-like presentation. Um, I don't know if I would do that again, because it scared some students. I'll think about that this year. Um, but that was, that was the way we did it last year, because I wanted that oral presentation piece. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I would really say is important is that you know your curriculum. So for a project like this, where everybody's doing very different things, you have to be able to be flexible to pull pieces from the curriculum that will meet each individual student's needs. So some students might be meeting some expectations and other students other expectations. And I just had to become really comfortable with that idea. So I thought I'd quickly show you some of the ways that I met those expectations. Um, so for oral language, because I'm a French language teacher, I built some things in that I knew specifically would meet those curriculum expectations. So knowledge building circles, where we got together, we shared what we had learned, and I could get information about their spontaneous communication. Same with one-on-one -on -one conferences. I already uh, mentioned that we did an oral presentation 
There was a rubric, they knew what to expect. That was a formal presentation piece. This is where I had to be flexible <clears throat> with different projects. There were different kinds of things happening. So with iMovie, there was some voice recording. And they were demonstrating certain skills that I could then pull in from the curriculum and conference with the expectations about that. And then I could use that on an evaluation even. Um, writing expectations. This was the thing that I thought was really good that we did this time. We created blogs and we reflected at the end of each session on our process. So that kept them accountable and it was also a really important idea about reflecting on what we had learned. So I gave them prompts like, what did you learn today? What was the struggle today? Um, how could you overcome this difficulty? What successes did you have today? And so they blogged regularly. I used Weebly, this year I'll use Google Sites so that they can carry that with them because it will belong to them. Um, and then again, sometimes I had to be flexible. Certain students were writing scripts to create a movie, so I got different kind of writing expectations out of them. Reading was tricky for French. If any of you teach French, you know, reading online, doing research online in French is hard because the level of the language is pretty advanced. So I just decided that I would have to probably address most of my reading expectations outside of Genius Hour through other means. And then media expectations came from all kinds of places. So the website students were creating, um, uh, the slideshow, everyone had a slideshow at the end for their TED talk. And then um, animations and movies, I had to be flexible and personalize for each student in that situation. It sounds messy, but when you give them a lot of time and they're working and they're engaged, so they're busy doing their thing, you get a lot of time to conference and to check in and see where they are. I thought, I think I have some time. I'll show you a couple of projects that came out of this. Um, this is Jamie. She decided she wanted to learn how to make stop motion animations using clay. So she brought in her clay and she started off with a really simple one. All of them were about celebrations, special days throughout the year. This is a really short one that she made about grandma. <laughs> She solved a ton of problems you don't see in there. She figured out how could she get the, um, the groundhog to come up out of the ground without you seeing the maneuvering that she was doing. Um, then she decided to try to make it a little bit more complicated. So she made this one called Merry Christmas, which has a Christmas dragon in it. <laughs> So she started simple and then she got a little bit more confident and then she started adding voices in her later um, presentations. Um, these, this is an example of um, the blog. This was the Knitting for Refugees and these girls, they decided they wanted a bigger audience because uh, their blogs had to be in French for the French expectations and the French curriculum and they said, but we could reach more people if we also did the English. So they made a bilingual blog. <laughs> so they did extra work outside of French so that they could reach that audience that they wanted to reach. So then um, they went on and they, they blogged about their successes and challenges on a regular basis. And that was really good for me to get information about how well they were communicating with a specific audience and an audience that was broader than just me and the class. Um, I'll show you one more. Zoe's projects. This is Zoe is the girl who, she had spent some time in Benin, Benin, Benin West Africa, and um, she decided that the students there, they, had a, they were developing a library and she wanted to contribute. So she wanted to make videos about 
um, using English books to teach them how to read. So <coughs> she just used explain everything. Goldfish are red. Elephants are gray. Pigs are pink. All animals have a color of their own. So um, she did this project in one week. And I had given them several months, November till April. She said, can I do this because I know somebody who's going back to West Africa and they can take these videos with them and put them in the library. So she did this within a week and then she started something else after. So there was that flexibility in the projects. Um, the tricky part we ran into with this is the copyright issue. We ran into that a few times, creating videos because of music students wanted to use and that was a big learning curve too. And so I learned, I talked to the DLSTs about it, we all kind of learned together and we made mistakes and that was okay and I was honest with them about the mistakes that we made. Um, I knew that this was successful because Mary Sue Meredith came in and she interviewed some of my kids and the things that they said made it seem like, yep, yeah, this is this was a good project and this is why. So this is Zoe, she's the one who just who made those books that I just showed you. And her just talking about her project. Hi, my name is Zoe Sears. I'm in grade seven at McGregor Senior Public School in the Waterloo Day Region District School Board. In this learning activity, we got to do a project on whatever we were passionate about and whatever we wanted. And so everyone in the class did something different, and we got 20% of our time to do this project. So I did, I made recorded books in English to help kids in West Africa learn how to speak English. So their, in their first language is French. And so I made these books on a recording and I had the pages <coughs> and I did a laser pointer while I was talking to help them learn English and we sent them with someone who was going there. <laughs> I visited there in grade four so I had a personal connection with them and it really it helped me to understand what they were going through more since I didn't know them. Well, we got to do anything we wanted so that was very different and you could just do something that you were passionate about instead of having a teacher telling you what to do. And also we got to use a lot of technology like for our final presentation. <coughs> and I used a lot of technology when I was making the books by using the app to explain everything. And that was different in our, because in our other classes we don't get to use as much technology. This time I have to connect with the way I'd like to learn because I'm a kinesthetic learner and in this, um, this project we got to do a lot of I got to do something and help people, and that was really good for me because I don't really like to just look at stuff or hear stuff. I like to actually be doing something, and that's why I think this was a good project. So that idea of doing something, and that she had the choice to do something to help people that meant something to her, um, that really solidified for me that this was a, a good thing to do despite the messiness of the project itself and despite the challenges of individualizing the curriculum. Um, I would recommend that you give it a try if you haven't already or that you try it again um, if you've tried it before. So that's it. If there, are there any questions? Or... Yeah. So your time allotment, is it sort of a couple hours a day? Yeah. Or... I didn't do it every day. So because we're rotary, um, we were on an eight-day schedule. So I chose two, um, four 48 minute periods in the cycle. So there were two 48 minute periods and two 48 minute periods each cycle, um, which was about 20% of our French time. Thank you. Yeah. Did you have any students that would finish up early? Yes, so I had students who chose projects that were, that they wouldn't last the whole time. So the idea was, the importance was them reflecting on what they had done and then moving on to something else. Okay. And then in the end, when they did their final presentation, they talked about all of it, the whole process. So, yeah, that flexibility is pretty important. What's yeah. your technology ratio? Uh, last year, we had six Chromebooks in our class, for the whole class, and I would just beg, borrow, and steal from other people. We were lucky, though. I know some people don't even have that. Um, I just made, I let them know this is, what we have, we're limited, so we're going to have to choose projects that kind of fit into what resources we can get. 